Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? So good to see your smiling faces out there. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Are you ready to worship the Lord? Why don't you tell two or three people I'm glad you're here this morning? Lord, we love you this morning. We come to bless you. We lift our hearts to you. We invite you into this place this morning. Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that it's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait. Worship with your hands up in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Times you gotta praise in the prison. I'll praise him anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. Every step, each and every breath. Come on, I'll praise you anywhere. Faithful day of my life, blessings day and night. Countless reasons why. Come on, I'll praise you anywhere. Every promise kept. Goodness every step, each and every breath. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, giving praise, giving praise in the highest praise. Giving praise, giving praise. Is anybody here for the 8 o'clock service? <laughs> <laughs> turned, up, turned up a little early today? But that's, um, anyway, well, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And, uh, you know, Tim Keffler, who comes from Southern California, he normally leaves, I think, 2 in the morning. I think he probably had to leave at 1 in the morning to get here uh, this morning for worship. Around 2, okay, so, yeah. <laughs> Still, that's a case of do I go to bed, do I not go to bed? I don't know, but anyway... Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. If you're a guest with us or if it's one of your first few times of being here, we appreciate your presence. We'd love to know that you were here. If you want to fill in a Connect card that's at the pew in front of you, 
uh, then we would just send you some information about the church, either through the mail or through email, whichever one you prefer, uh, so that we can let you know about things going on here, different events that happen. Uh, we have constant events going on here all the time, and it is great things. Uh, also for prayer requests, if, you, if you'd like to fill out a prayer request card, uh, then uh, just on the back side of the Connect card, just put it in the offering box on the way out, uh, and we will pray for you this coming week. Uh, also, if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us online. Uh, we appreciate you being there. We are having some issues <laughs> with internet, surprise, surprise, and um, so if you get cut off, we will try and reconnect as quickly as possible. We did an internet change this week, and it's played havoc with a few things, so we're just trying to work through those, so just uh, be patient, please. Um, all right, uh, the pie auction. So thank you very much. If you were part of the pie auction last week, whether you donated something that was auctioned off or whether you were part of the group that was participating in this fast and furious and very high value um, uh, auction that was going on. You know, it was uh, difficult to buy anything because everything went for so much money. But anyway, um, the result of that is great because we raised um, a little over $24,000 uh, for the thing, which is huge. <clears throat> Yeah, which is amazing. It's not a record, but it's getting, it's getting up there close to that. So uh, as an extension of that, uh, we have, and if you were there that night, you would have seen the board of envelopes that were there and different envelopes uh, pinned to a board that had different dollar amounts on them. So if you'd like to take one and just put that dollar amount in there by check or cash or whatever, uh, then we would appreciate it. It's just extending on the sort of fundraising for Mexico, and that's out in the pavilion t uh, this morning. Um, but you know, we, the money that go, this goes towards is for the mission trip for kids going to Mexico. Uh, it's also, they're doing a building project this, this year, so that takes a little extra for materials, et cetera. So we're grateful to everybody that uh, helped with that particular fundraiser this past weekend. It was a lot of fun. And Pastor Tim is just a very talented auctioneer. Uh, so he always makes it a great event. Um, women's Retreat is coming up. So if you'd like more information on the Women's Retreat or you'd like to order a T-shirt that's associated with the Women's Retreat, then uh, Karen will be out in the pavilion after service. Uh, she'll also help you uh, get signed up if you want to get signed up. You don't have to you know, go on the Women's Retreat in order to get a T-shirt. If you want a T-shirt anyway, she will take an order for you for that as well. Uh, she'll also be taking uh, ticket sales for the Bunko event that's coming up uh, in the middle of the month, March 16th uh, at 11.30 over in the barn. So if you'd like to go to the Bunko event, she can help you get signed up with that as well. Or you can go through our web page and uh, go through the events page and sign up online there, and that is uh, $10. Uh, baptism is coming up, so we have a, a sort of twice a year we do baptisms. This one is on April 7th, so it's the week, it's the week after Easter. So uh, if you'd like to be baptized on that Sunday, we will be doing baptisms in the 9.30 service and the 11 o'clock service. Just let us know, put it on an online card, I mean, put it on a card or just go online and sign up that way, and then we'll send you information uh, and some invitations that you can give to family and friends uh, in order to uh, invite them to your baptism to witness that. So uh, if you'd like to do that, just let us know and we'll get you on the list. So let us know uh, whether you'd like to be baptized and which service you'd like to be baptized in. Um, Thursday morning men's Bible study. We are starting a new study. Pastor Tim is going to be teaching about Hebrews. Uh, and that starts uh, on March 21st, and that's 6 a.m. to 6.45. So if you'd like to come to that, uh, we always start pretty close to 6 a.m., but we always finish at 6.45 because we know that people have places to go. So um, if you'd like to join in with that, just come along. Don't have to sign up for it, and that'll be on Hebrews starting March 21st. Uh, Easter is coming up. It's the end of this month. So um, if you would like to invite people to Easter, we have some postcards in the uh, foyer. If you'd like to take one or two or more of those just to hand out to co-workers, friends, anybody that you would like to invite to Easter, there's a postcard. It looks pretty much like that. It has the times of the service on it. Uh, it also has Good Friday service on it, which is at 6 p.m. So we had two services that week. Um, Normal service times on, on Easter, but Good Friday is 6 p.m. We have a guest speaker for Good Friday, so come along and find out who that is. Um, well, speaking of Easter, we have a pathway to Easter coming up, which is uh, something that we're doing is sort of a family walk through things. Anybody who's invited to participate in that, just come uh, at f between 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock. It's kind of just come every 15 minutes, we'll start this walk through, and it'll be in the children's building. 
and it'll have different stations. So when you first start, you'll be going through like, the entry into Jerusalem, and then it'll be the Last Supper, and then it'll be the Garden of Gethsemane, and then it'll be the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. So it walks you through that life of Christ, or that week of Christ, and then uh, after that, there'll be an opportunity to meet in the barn, have some snacks and fellowship after that. So it's a Wednesday night, 27th of March, uh, between 5 and 7 p.m. will be the last walkthrough as well. So, um, so there'll be every 15 minutes. So come along to that. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, if you have kids or you don't have kids, it doesn't matter. If you have grandkids, bring them. Uh, there'll be activities for the kids as well as part of that. Um, April is coming up, so that's Rodeo Month. And uh, around here, we like to celebrate Rodeo Month. So, uh, of course, the whole of month of April, if you feel like wearing a hat and a belt and a pair of boots, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, well, you're always welcome to do that, but especially in April. Uh, we are bringing back the Rodeo Roundup. That's coming back in uh, April. We used to do that years ago. There'll be pork sandwiches. There'll be uh, sort of a chili cook-off, a pie-eating contest, some line dancing, and some mini horses for the kids. And so just an opportunity to celebrate Rodeo Month. Uh, also, men's breakfast next uh, next month is going to be at the rodeo grounds. So instead of here at the church, men's breakfast will be at the rodeo grounds. Some details will come out about that and where to meet, etc. But there'll be actual rodeo uh, activities going on that morning as well. So it'll be an opportunity just to hang out and watch that after the breakfast if you'd like to. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, prayer requests that we have this morning. Uh, Brian Aramura, who was in the, he was back in the last service. He was in hospital last week, but uh, he was... Uh, released early part of the week, so we're just grateful for that. So just continue to pray for his recovery. Uh, Irma McGuinn has been in hospital for a little while. She had an infection and uh, very low blood pressure, so they've been trying to bring her blood pressure up, and they finally did surgery yesterday uh, to remove um, an infection, an infected part there. So she's doing much better. Uh, she's just tired, resting right now, so she'll be in for another couple of days uh, in hospital. But uh, certainly she's doing so much better, so we're grateful for that. Uh, Steve Bradley, who's my neighbor uh, and also a friend of some people here, uh, he had a heart attack Friday morning, uh, had open heart surgery in the afternoon, and so uh, he's at Clovis Community recovering from that in a lot of pain, so we just pray for him uh, this morning, and uh, hopefully I'll get to see him later today. Uh, Mark Blakesley, who's normally in our 8 o'clock service, he's been sick for some time. It's developed into this chest problems and lung issues. So uh, it's very common right now, but just pray for him so that he can get back to work because he does need to keep working. Uh, and then last week we prayed for Elaine Higuera. Um, I went to see her yes, uh, on Sunday afternoon and um, had a great visit with her. And then later on on Sunday she had a stroke, uh, and then on Tuesday morning she passed away. So uh, there'll be details of her service coming up uh, here at New Hope. Um, so just pray for her family. Uh, also, Joe Newby, if you've been New Hope for some time, Joe Newby used to attend here. Um, she passed away recently as well. Her service will be here on March 26th here at New Hope, uh, along with the reception. So uh, you are welcome to attend that. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll continue with worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful for our uh, time together this morning. We're grateful for an opportunity to develop new relationships, to uh, deepen relationships with people here. And Lord, as we pray to you this morning, we just ask and lift up these people uh, who have been called out in prayer, those that are recovering from different things. We just pray that they will uh, recover quickly and that your healing hands will be on them. And Lord, we just pray for those who are uh, mourning the loss of somebody in their family. And we're just so grateful. Uh, that we, at times like that, can look to you. We are so grateful for the strength you give us. We're so grateful for the comfort that you can provide for us. But most of all, we're, we're thankful for the hope and the peace that we have in this world because of where we know we are going. So, Lord, we just uh, thank you for that. But, Lord, as we pray to you this week, we just pray that we will uh, have this sort of posture of thanks. And that as we go to prayer, we are just grateful for the things in our lives. We, we don't focus on the bad, but uh, we can initially focus on the good and think about uh, the good things you provide for us, perhaps even create lists. But Lord, we just there's so much good that you provide for us each and every day. The fact that we can wake up in the morning with a fresh start, that is a gift in itself. And Lord, we just, uh, so we just pray that we remember that even though we have challenges in our life, and even though there are things we desperately need to pray for to you, that, Lord, we also get to thank you. 
the creation around us. We often overlook it. We bypass it. We don't even look anymore. But this time of year, Lord, we see all the things budding and, and the creation coming back to life after the winter. So, Lord, help us to appreciate that in our prayer time this week. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we worship you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love this song. I believe it. Everybody say, I believe it. I believe in the life of Jesus. Say, I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe he's coming back again. I believe that his spirit is with us. I believe that he gives us power. I believe he is the son of God. I believe it. I believe it. It's not just a story. It's a living, breathing, walking testimony of a God so good he'd leave his home in glory for the world he loved, for the world that he so loved. Oh, it's not just a story. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe that he conquered death. I believe in the resurrection. I believe he's coming back again. I believe that his spirit's with us. I believe that he gives us power. If I said I got here on my own, I'd be lying. Cause my eyes have seen the goodness of the Father. We're the ones he loved, we're the ones that he so loves. Yeah, I can't deny. Oh no, I believe in the life of Jesus. Yeah. 
Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me so us are free this morning. Amen. How many of us are free this morning? Hallelujah. Oh Lord, 
my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy path throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul. It was amazing. Very reflective of how great God is. All right, we're in Acts 19 today. Acts 19, and we are unleashed this year. We are unleashed, and the subject for the year is how we are on mission for God, serving Him in the right way, the way that we are called to serve. And this is part of this is figuring out how we are called to serve. What is it that we should be doing in the kingdom of God when we are on mission? 
And once we're on track, once we're on mission, then we can tap into the Holy Spirit to guide us according to His will. And we can find that our efforts get multiplied through the Lord's blessing. The things that we thought would have been completely uh, unable to do, beyond our reach, suddenly become more of a reality, much more achievable. Not through our own merit, not through our own strength, but through the Lord working through us. One of the ways that we've been examining this example of how to be on mission is to look at the second missionary journey of Paul. But the reality is that we're not actually in the second missionary journey of Paul anymore. We've now evolved into the third missionary. And I have a map just to give you an idea of what the third mission journey of Paul looks like, because now we've kind of moved from, in chapter 18, we kind of moved on from the second journey into the third journey, but they are all connected together. And today we'll be looking at chapter 19, or at least we'll be focusing mostly on the second half of chapter 19. And it says, at the beginning of that chapter, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Ephesus. And you can see it on the map, Ephesus is up uh, halfway up um, in uh, Turkey. So this was, it wasn't Paul's first trip to Ephesus. This wasn't his first time visiting Ephesus. Uh, last week, Pastor Kyle in chapter 18 covered, uh, uh, he covered that, and then Paul, it says in there, was in Ephesus briefly. In verses 19 through 21 in chapter 18, it says, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila he, made him, uh, he himself went to the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and when they asked him to spend a little bit more time, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set, set sail from Ephesus. So it was God's will. And here he is back in Ephesus on the third mission journey. So let's take a minute just to learn a little bit about what Ephesus is. What is Ephesus all about? Put some context into where we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the letter that Paul wrote much later on, Ephesians, was to the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. It's now a town called Selçuk. Has anyone been to Ephesus or Selçuk? Okay. So you'll be familiar with a lot of this, or at least uh, some of the pictures we're going to show uh, of some of the areas there. But uh, it's somewhat of a shadow of its former self, because back in Paul's day, it was the capital of Asia Minor's western region. It was known as a proconsular Asia. And of course, it was under Roman rule at the time. And the population of Selchuk right now is 36,000 people. But back then, in Paul's day, in the first century, it was closer to 250,000 people. So it was a much bigger uh, area than it is now. And it was about 220,000 citizens and about 30,000 slaves. Ephesus was famous for the temple of Artemis, or Diana, as she was known in the Roman name. But great crowds of people were attracted to Ephesus because of the cult of Artemis and the famous temple that was there. And we have a picture of a rendering of the famous temple because there's not much left of it now. But this is what it would have looked like. <clears throat> it was made of solid marble. The dimensions of this monstrosity of a building was over 500 feet long, over 100 feet wide, so it covered an, over 91,000 square feet, which is like a two-acre building. And just in case you weren't sure if the temple had a bit of a presence in Ephesus, I mean, just look at it. It really would have been quite something to look at. 127 iconic columns that were 60 feet tall, decorated with ornate friezes, it was brilliantly gilded in gold and in silver. The altar was large enough to be able to sacrifice hundreds of animals simultaneously. And then during the feast days that honored Artemis, the population uh, of Ephesus would triple. It's kind of like when Taylor Swift comes to town. <laughs> the population triples. But also, a lot of wealth comes along with it. The economy of the city becomes blessed in many ways. And every year they would have this fe the, all these feast days honoring Artemis. The temple was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And as well as being a place where ritual, uh, religious rituals would take place, which obviously was its primary purpose, it also served as one of the largest banks of the ancient world. It was internationally recognized as a place of refuge. So anybody that needed protection, anybody that needed asylum could go to this temple but beyond that, it was also filled with some great works of art as well. So it was quite something. And this is relevant to our understanding of Paul's position because 
just as Paul had commented on the number of gods in, a, in Athens, because remember, two weeks ago I said he went to Athens, there were 30,000 gods, or they were considered to be 30,000 gods in Athens at the time for 10,000 people. Well, here in Ephesus, the emphasis is very much on the cult of Artemis or Diana. It was run exclusively by women. It was very much a religious center for that area at the time. And so we get into Acts 19, and the second half of Acts 19, uh, starting at verse 23. It says, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in, uh, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus in, and in practically the whole province of Asia. Again, this is nice to hear that Paul is affecting such a large area. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Paul has been in Ephesus at this point for over two years, and he's been teaching the gospel of Christ, building the church of Ephesus, and apparently he was making some serious headway into, it, into this very religious city, religious based on Artemis mostly, and Ephesus is no different than the other places that Paul had been to on his journeys. He came across a lot of opposition. And just to skip back into the early parts of chapter 19 now, just to show you what kind of opposition it was, uh, it's, it came in the form of hardened hearts of the Jewish believers there. They ended up blaspheming the way. It says in verse 9, and some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. They publicly mal maligned the way. Uh, and Paul's answer to that was he left the synagogue. He went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this was a big public hall where both uh, Jewish people and Gentiles, the Greeks, could gather together. They would debate many issues. They would listen to philosophy but now he had a much wider audience than he had before. The other type of thing that he came up against was a hypocrisy that came from these exorcists that were going around and using religion as a cloak to make themselves look so much better. Verses 13 through 16, it says, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who, uh, who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. But this, uh, you know, long term, this opposition ended up having a big effect because there was a great effect because the name of Jesus, Jesus was very much held in honor. There were sorcery scrolls that it talked about that were sacrificed and burned. There was the word of the Lord that spread, and the word of the Lord became more and more powerful. And then, when we get to the section we're looking at, verse 23, it says, And about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. Um, the way being the name for the church, the, modern, the name for the modern church. And the second half of this chapter is where we'll focus most of our attention. It switches gears a little bit. And now it starts off with Demetrius. He calls this meeting, Demetrius was a silversmith. He calls this meeting because he makes shrines to Artemis, and Paul was beginning to have an effect on his business. Not as many people wanted shrines to Artemis anymore because now they were following the way, the new church. Less people needed them. And so uh, these other craftsmen in the area were seeing the same effect. So he called them together and said, this fellow Paul is creating problems for us economically. And again, it's good for Paul, it's good for Paul to see because he really is making a difference, especially there in Ephesus. Everywhere he goes, though, he seems to end up upsetting people for various reasons. And this is economic. Um, the merchants, they were worried primarily about their own income. I remember in chapter 16 of Acts, we covered earlier on, in chapter 16 I talked about a slave girl who was possessed by evil spirits. It, see, she had this supposed ability to tell fortunes or to fortune tell, and her owners were making money off her fortune telling uh, or supposed fortune telling. And then Paul, and she kept calling out Paul and his companions, calling them out, calling out, until finally Paul had enough and said, cast out the evil spirit, she was no longer uh, useful to the owners because she could no longer 
tell fortunes. So here again, Gentiles are upset with Paul because they're beginning to lose their ability to earn income uh, in, from this false god in Ephesus. But it's interesting, in verse 27, if you look at this, the, the last part of what I just read, it said there is a danger not only to our trade will lose its good name, but also to the temple of the great goddess Artemis who will be discredited, and the goddess herself will be robbed of her divine majesty. The goddess herself will be robbed of her divine majesty. I'm glad that we serve a God whose majesty, whose sovereignty does not depend on us to feed it. Because the implication here is that Artemis will fade into insignificance if people stop worshipping her. And 2,000 years later, she has faded into insignificance because people stopped worshipping her. But our God, the God that we serve, is still as present today as he was back then and he will continue to be. But things escalated. Again, as we see in Acts, it's a constant thing. Everywhere Paul goes, things seem to escalate. And from their discussion about loss of income now comes anger. And perhaps anger isn't a strong enough word because in verse 26 it says, When they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This could be described as hatred on the part of the silversmiths and the other merchants, which again led to inciting this mob towards violence. Then verse 29, it says, Then the whole city was in an uproar. Again, the, the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus and pe- uh, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. All of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd and the disciples would not let him. Uh, but even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. This is the mob mentality. Half the people were in there going, well, I don't know, everyone was coming this way, so I thought I'd just tag along. (laughs) What are we doing here? Is there a show? But uh, the Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front. They shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make the defense before the people But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So if you're trying to conjure up in your mind this image of what all this looked like, this mayhem, first of all, again, there's been a situation where there's a mob gets together, they grab the nearest believers that they can find and take them, not this time to the authorities, but now they take them to the theater. And then not because they want to give give them a show, but they take them to the theater. And this is a large open-air amphitheater. We have a picture of that as well. This is a modern-day picture. Uh, And if you've been there, you would understand what this looks like. But it's huge. It's the largest public arena in the city. It was cut into the hillside facing the harbor, and it could accommodate 25,000 people seated and even more standing. So the Jews pushed Alexander to the front, uh, and we're not quite sure who Alexander is. Luke mentions him, but he's not mentioned before, so it's not like we sort of oh, we refer back to this. We're not quite sure who he is. He's potentially uh, one of two things. He could either have been a known Christian, in which case they shove him up front and say, focus all your attention on him because we want to deflect from uh, the Jewish people here. Uh, but what seems more likely is that he was a leading Jewish person. Someone that was trusted by the Jews there who said, okay, you go up and defuse this thing because you're a leader here. Um, And so the idea was that he would go up and defend it and say, you know, this Christian group, the the way is not some sect of, of the Jewish faith. They have nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with why this started. But he didn't really get much opportunity. He he said it motioned for silence, so he probably put his hand up and they probably went silent, but then they realized that he was a Jew, so they didn't give him a lot of time to defend that, and so he basically uh, was yelled off the stage. And they began to shout, for two hours it says, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours, it must have been an extraordinary event, just the crowd, that many people in that huge theater just shouting and shouting over and over again, chanting, uh, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And finally, Verse 35, it says, the city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, don't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not to do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our God, but goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. 
If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. Uh, in that case, we would not be able to account for this connection or commotion since there is no reason for it. And after this was said, he dismissed, dismissed the assembly. So the city clerk was a very important person in the city government. And one of his responsibilities and in his role was to issue the decrees and to issue the commands that were reached by public assembly. And so for him to be able to silence a crowd, it wouldn't have been unusual for him. But this man shows incredible leadership in the face of some pretty uh, sort of passionate anger. There's no indication that he was a believer of Christ. There's no indication that he was a follower of Artemis, but it's, that's more than likely. But maybe he was just a good politician. Because first of all, what he did was he connected with the men of Ephesus. He said, men of Ephesus. And then he emphasized to them by sort of stroking their ego and saying, the entire world knows that Ephesus is the guardian of the temple, the great Artemis. And at this point, he also reminded uh, that the, since the whole world knew, their, knew that, that there was a very important position for them to hold in the world, and they would be respected as such. But then he cleverly inserted a therefore. And he said, in order to indicate, if we are so revered in the world and honored in the world to have such a great responsibility, there, therefore, we should, it should require some decorum. It should require some order. So this unnamed clerk saw the injustice against these two Christians, and despite any beliefs that he had, he, didn't, he wasn't going to allow that. But he told the mob that the men didn't, hadn't committed any crime, they hadn't done anything wrong at all, but his true message to the crowd that day really was, refined and respected citizens of Ephesus probably shouldn't be behaving like uncouth and uncivilized barbarians. What's more, his suggestion seems to imply that perhaps they were so refined and civil that perhaps if they had any legitimate legal concerns or problems, then they should take it up in the proper way. They should go to the local legal authorities. A riot is not an appropriate way to deal with legal matters. And he told them if they continued in this unrest, this civil unrest, and they themselves could be arrested for doing just that because they were under Roman rule ultimately. And the Romans did not like civil unrest. The Romans just wanted people to quietly pay their taxes, and that's it, not cause any trouble. So they didn't like this kind of thing. So there was laws against it. So he was basically advising them that they'd be better off taking up due process with any of their issues with the courts. Chalk that one up for the city clerk. What was the result? Well, after making his case, he dismissed the crowd. And according to Acts 20, verse 1, uh, it says, when the uproar had ended. So it's, it's interesting to see God's grace alive and well, also in the lives of unbelievers, but also in the lives of unbelieving leaders like this city clerk. But it makes you wonder how many Christian leaders placed in a similar circumstance would have handled it quite as well. But there are some weighty lessons that we can learn from this historical snapshot of this anonymous clerk in Ephesus. But before I talk about idols, which is where I really want to go today, let's just talk quickly about one leadership lesson that we can learn from this city clerk. It's important to understand that the clerk didn't bend or change according to the will of the crowd, according to the pressure he was getting from the crowd, the mob's desires, uh, so that he could gain favor with them. He certainly didn't pander to the crowd that day. And uh, this can often be a personal failing for many of us. This idea of just kind of putting our finger up to the wind to see which way it's blowing. It's very tempting to just change our view according to the majority rule. Essentially, uh, it's especially bad if we dislike confrontation. We have much greater tendency to do that. But that's not leadership. That just becomes a fear of man more than we have a fear of God. And as soon as we begin to have a greater fear of what people think of us than what God knows of us, then we're on a slippery slope. The city clerk chose to do what was right, even in the face of potential opposition. But how many times as Christians have we backed down from a position, even if we know that it's a God-ordained position, because of pressure from the mob, or pressure from family, pressure from friends, groups? And don't get me wrong, no one should aim to die on every hill that comes along. 
and take an inflexible stand for everything at the expense of all the relationships in their lives. But some principles, some convictions, some values that we have in life should be uncompromised, should be held onto at all times. As parents, often we bend to the will of our children because it just helps keep the peace. We've been entrusted to them or with them by God. We are to shepherd them, and we generally know what's best for them, but sometimes mob mentality can take over, especially if you have a lot of kids on certain things. They gang up against you, <laughs> and that's okay in some circumstances. But still, there are things that when it comes to raising our kids that we shouldn't, or we don't, or we certainly shouldn't compromise on. We should stand firm, even in the face of a mob. God appointed leaders must exercise wisdom and courage in these types of situations. And if you think that the word leader excludes you from that particular thing, you think, well, I'm not a leader of anything. Well, everybody's a leader of something in some capacity, whether it's at your job or whether it's a family or whether it's a group of friends or whether it's your own life that you have to lead and, and uh, take on for yourself. But often we just think to ourselves, it's easier just to go along with the flow. Often it's also said it's true that all of us together are smarter than one of us. Many counselors or advisors is better than just one, but that's not always the case, as is shown in this episode in Ephesus. The city clerk here was able to apply wisdom. He was able to act on what he knew was to be right, and he showed the best leadership that he could. And in this election year, no, I'm not going to get political. But in this election year, we should watch how we react to mob mentality. And we should apply God's wisdom to the way that we decide to vote. Because at the end of the day, it's not about politics. What it is about is merely how we apply God's word to our lives and to apply God's word to everything around us and how we apply what is right and what is wrong, irrespective of politics. God is not unclear about what is right and what is wrong. But an area that we can examine from the text also is this idea that as we become unleashed and on mission for God in our own lives, there will be occasions when we walk into dark places. Ephesus was a city of great wickedness. Many people had morals like animals there, even if the city clerk was trying to paint this picture of civility. That's what made him such a good politician. But it was certainly a place of spiritual darkness. This huge number of people that believed in this God but fortunately, Paul was bringing the brightest light that he could, and that is the gospel of Christ. Paul saw this darkness as, a, uh, as an opportunity. It was very much a place of opportunity for, for him because he had the right philosophy about darkness and the opportunity it brings. Because when we think about opportunities, it's really about perspective. Many years ago, there were two salesmen who were sent by a British shoe manufacturer to Africa to investigate and report on the market potential in Africa. The first salesman reported back, there is no potential in Africa, nobody wears shoes. The second salesman reported back, there is massive potential here, nobody wears shoes. This is a sim simple illustration of how one thing can create either this view of hopelessness or this view of massive potential. And we Christians should be going into dark places but a lot of times, Christians today don't want to be in those dark places. And we look for the nearest exit, wanting only to get out of there as quickly as possible. We may have this mentality of that there's so many lost people at my work, I just need to get out of there. But that's why God puts us there in the first place, because it's a dark place. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew 5 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So it says, we are the light of the world. And what better place to put a light than in a dark place? If we walk into a dark room and flip the switch, do we just turn, away, turn around and abandon the idea of going into that room? It's like, well, the light doesn't work in here. I guess I'm not going in here. No, we go get a light bulb. We create light in there, and then it's not dark anymore. That being said, we should be careful about going into places that will drag us down or seek out places where we know that we will be tempted to do things that we shouldn't 
But then God doesn't want us to be hermits either. We are to be in the world, just not of it. God has placed us in the, at, at a door, a door of opportunity. The question is, do we walk through it? The darker the room, the more our light will be seen. Our light doesn't stand out very much in this room, fortunately. Why? Because it's filled with other lights. Maybe it's a workplace, maybe it's a family gathering, maybe it's a specific event, but we need to walk through the door and just be different, be a light, something that opposes the darkness of this world, something that all eyes will focus on, seeing the light in our eyes will want to make them step into the light themselves. Paul, in this case, wanted to stay until Pentecost. Why? Because at that time, around May, was the Artemisian Games. And at that point, the whole Roman Empire descended upon this city. It was a great opportunity, and he saw it as a great opportunity. He didn't just think, oh, there's so many Romans coming, there's going to be a lot of danger, there's going to be a lot of disagreement, maybe more mobs. He just saw a great opportunity to be a light in stifling darkness. There was a youth director at Trinity Baptist Church in Jacksonville in Florida, Ron Riley, he began to take a small group of spiritually gifted young people to the beaches of Daytona during the Easter holidays for three days of witnessing. Witnessing during the infamous Daytona Beach spring break. If you're not familiar with it, I will tell you what it's about. But this project broadened to such, an appoint, such a point where young people from churches all across the country began to participate in it. And over the 43 years that they were doing this ministry, they reported that over 101,000 young people came to Christ. That's an average of over 2,300 per year just in that one spot at Daytona Beach. But just to give you an idea, there was 30, in its peak, there were 30 to 50,000 students going to Daytona Beach for spring break. It was famous for underage drinking, for public nudity, for drugs, for vandalism, for fights, and even you know, the rape of intoxicated young women. It was a dark place for sure. But Ron Riley and the young people he was discipling went about to change that. And the spring breakers had their own idols. They had their own Artemis, the pleasures of this world, even at the expense of others. We all have our own idols that we worship in some way. It can be something that we don't even think of as an idol. Anything that we put before our pursuit of God is an idol. Tim Keller, in his book, The Counterfeit God, said, an idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. So with that in mind, there are six primary idols that we as a culture spend a lot of time worshiping today. And I'm not saying it's just in here, it's everywhere. Culture as a whole. The first one is our identity. It's an idol, our identity. It's easy to place our identity in something or someone other than God. And currently, one way of obtaining identity is through social media following. How many people are following me? How many people are liking what I post? How many people are viewing what I put online? Or perhaps it's a position at work. How important am I at work? What is my abilities? What are my skills? What is my list of achievements in life or list of things that I would like to achieve? So not only is this an idol, it's a very difficult way to live. If our identity is wrapped up in our work, if it's wrapped up in our skills, our looks, or anything else, then we constantly feel like we're not measuring up. It's a very harsh master to serve. When our identity is rooted in God, when we consider ourselves a child of God, when we see ourselves as a disciple of Christ, it's then that we can finally live in freedom. Of course, we will fall short. But God's love will never fail us. He will continue to love us. And that doesn't work for the other things that we might place our identity in. So we have to be careful not to put more value on, what, on who we are in the world rather than in God. The second modern day idol is money or consumerism. Of course, this is not a modern day idol. This is an age old thing. But it still very much exists today. And if you don't uh, this doesn't have any dependence upon whether you have lots of money or you don't have lots of money. It doesn't matter. It's this pursuit of money and the acquisition of things that becomes an idol for a lot of people in our culture. And it's in this uh, that we trust money or trust things more than we trust God. And I'm not saying money is bad. Money is just a tool. But like any tool, we can use it in the right way or we can use it in the wrong way. And the wrong way with this can cause a lot of damage. 
Money itself isn't the problem, but how we use it and how we view it can become a problem. Many people place their hopes and dreams in money. Things will get better when I have more money. Problems will be over when I have more money. People will like me more when I have more money. It's a trust that provides for us. It's a trust that shows that it cares for us, that it protects us. The problem is it's an inanimate object. It's a tool. It cannot live up to what we are trying to get out of it. Money has become the ultimate thing for so many people in society. The fact is that money or the desire for money is driving people in our modern day culture to do things that were unthinkable years ago. You may have heard of or not, and I'm not going to ask who's heard of it because that will arouse some suspicious, but um, you may have heard of the website OnlyFans. It's an internet, so it went very quiet. It's an internet content subscription sort of site that people pay monthly. It's based out of London. Its site is primarily used for people who produce pornography. And I'm not saying professional photography. This is like everyday people that produce their own pornography, post it online. It could be people in your own neighborhoods. It also hosts work from other creators like musicians or from uh, people that do fitness experts or whatever, but that's a very small percentage of the people who post. The end of 2023, there were more than 3 million people uploading and posting content to this site. It was being viewed, in other words, subscribers of over 220 million people. In 2022, the revenue for OnlyFans was almost $1.1 billion. Some people, the subscribers, the, oh, not the subscribers, the people who post, the content creators, they can earn a few hundred dollars a month. Others earn millions a month from uploading. It's mind-blowing. Firstly, the equivalent of two-thirds of the United States population is subscribing to a service like this every single month. Uh, but mostly, it's the three million people that are now putting uh, money as such a high priority in their lives that they decide that posting sexual content of themselves online is okay and acceptable. I use this as an example because this particular company or this website gets commonly cited in the business press as being an example of one of the fastest growing companies in, in the world. And you can see from this that the desire for more and more money will drive us as a culture to do things that would have been unthinkable in the past. It's a motivating factor in our life. That, uh, if, our, if our motivating factor in life is money and not God, then it's an idol. The third one is entertainment. In our culture now, we are obsessed with entertainment, and it comes in a lot of forms. It could be Netflix to vacations, it could be video games to podcasts. We love all kinds of entertainment. And again, as with money, it's not entertainment that's bad. It can be a very good thing. But when our lives become about this constant search for entertainment all day, every day, chasing the best experiences that we can find, then it becomes an idol. It becomes more important than God. I'd argue that entertainment is good, and it's a gift from God, but we should worship the giver, not the gift. The fourth thing is sex. We're obsessed with sex in our culture. It's everywhere. It might be the only thing that we think about more than money. We've taken this gift from God and made it into a God of our own lives. And for many, their lives are controlled by sex. Sex addicts, pornography, things like that. To even question the sexual ethics in our society now brings on an onslaught of accusations, which actually shows us how tied to this idol we really are. Our sexual identity, sexual practices, sex lives have become so sacred to us. Just consider 220 subscribers to OnlyFans every single month, or 220 million. So for many today, sex is an idol. We value it more than we value God. The fifth one is comfort. And this sounds like an odd idol, comfort. What could be wrong with comfort? Well, there's an endless list of products that promise to simplify and add comfort to our lives. We have made our lives so much easier. We've made our lives so much more comfortable than any other time in history. Uh, tasks that used to take all day now can take a matter of minutes. Many menial tasks are now automated, and that's a good thing. That frees up our time for other things. But our pursuit should not be comfort alone. Jesus tells a very different narrative for his followers. He says uh, that his followers will face trial, they'll face persecution, they'll face, face difficulty, 
And while comfort isn't bad, it can be very damaging if it becomes the main pursuit in life. All I want to do is be comfortable. I do not want to do anything else except be comfortable. And when comfort is an idol, uh, then we will struggle when God calls us to something difficult. And then the last one, of course, is our phones. <laughs> Couldn't talk about idols without talking about phones, right? The smartphone addiction is increasingly a worrying trend. It's especially true for the Gen Z and the millennial generations, but it is certainly not confined to them. For so many of us, we simply cannot exist without our phones or at least some kind of online presence. This is quickly becoming an idol for many people. The problem isn't the phones. The problem isn't social media or any form of technology. It's the value that we place on it that makes it a problem. When our life revolves around how many likes we get, how many followers we get, or if we cannot sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing a news feed, then we might have an idol. Anything that takes the place of God in our life, anything that becomes more important to him, takes time away from what we could be doing to serve in his kingdom or to study his word, is an idol. It's easy to look back at the days of Paul and say, well, yes, he went to Athens. They had 30,000 gods there, and he was in uh, Ephesus, and they had the temple dedicated to Artemis, two acres of temple. I think, well, yeah, they had idols. They used to sell idols in the marketplace. As Paul continued his journey, he came across different cultures with different idols, which he had to overcome in order for them to hear the message of the gospel. They wouldn't listen until they could let go of the idols that they had in their lives. And as we become unleashed on God's mission, we also have to displace modern-day idols in order for others to hear our message. And this won't always be easy. Sometimes there will be a mob that will form against us. There will be a group of people who don't want us to say what we need to say, but we have to keep pushing, and we have to keep the light lit in the darkest of areas and not be afraid to take the light into the darkest of areas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the words of Luke, the example of Paul and his travels along with him, that they were not afraid to go into the darkest of places. So Lord, help us to see the dark places in our culture, the dark places in our society where we can be a light. But also, Lord, help us to protect ourselves against the idols that we can have in our lives, because that will bring us down, that will distract us from the, from the mission that you have for us. So Lord, help us to have discernment in what we do, the discipline in what we do, to be able to stay on track. Yes, enjoy some of the good things of this life, but also primarily to be focusing on you, and to be focusing on your message, and to be focusing on the work that we need to do in your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and we just pray that we can not look to self but to look to you constantly, to not be guided by crowds, but to be guided by your light. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to join us in person next week at any of our services, 8, 9.30, or 11, or join us online again at 9.30. New Hope is a church for the entire family. We have ministries for all ages. During our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, our children's ministry welcomes all kids, infants through sixth grade, and our student ministry has its own engaging service at 11 o'clock specifically for your junior high and high school students. We'd love to get to know your entire family. You can find out more about New Hope and all the different events and classes that go on throughout the week on our website or on social media. If you have any questions about New Hope, or would like to take the next step in your faith, reach out to us by phone or email or stop by the church office. Thank you again for being with us and hope to see you soon.